Okay, so now we're recording. Um, so we're jumping into chapter 31, alternating current as opposed to direct current. So it means the current is alternating in direction, right? It's going forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, back. And the usual way that we describe that is with a sine or a cosine, right? There are more ways of having alternating current. For example, um, in lab, we've already seen, uh, for example, square waves in lab, right? The function generators that we've used uh, for part of our oscilloscope labs, we used a square wave. Um, and those are alternating provided the current goes negative. So anytime you have current which is positive and then negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, that's what we would define to be alternating current. So we're not strictly limited to sinusoidal functions. We can do other things too. And um, those are mostly used by electrical engineers. Um, and so we'll kind of stay away. We'll stick to kind of the physics stuff, just focus on the physics and just here's a nice thing we can do with sines and cosines. Um, <clears throat> sines and cosines are well behaved, right? Derivative of a sine gives you a cosine, derivative of a cosine gives you a minus sine, right? And so um, we won't have to deal with anything like, for example, on a square wave, where you have jump discontinuity, right? You try to take the derivative um, as the function jumps to a negative value, then we could run into some issues there. Okay, so um, we've established what we mean by alternating current. And for our particular case, it means sinusoidal current. Um, that also means sinusoidal voltage. So we could go ahead and include that in here um, uh, as well if we wanted to. Um, but basically the idea at this stage is to look at what happens when we have um, inductors, capacitors, and resistors all together. We saw that once already in passing, and it, we, we noticed that it was a really difficult problem to handle when we had a DC source. Okay, so we did look, we didn't look at it in much detail. But we did look at um, the solution to this kind of um, to this kind of circuit here, where this is a DC battery, right? And we saw this thing was like exponential something with a T and multiplied by like a cosine, you know, something T, right? So um, the solutions were pretty pretty nasty, right? This was a second order uh, differential equation, second order differential equation. And uh, in order to solve that, we need to draw on more uh, math than what's a requirement for this class, right? So we shouldn't spend too much time on that. Now, what we're going to see is that when we actually use AC current, this problem simplifies greatly. And actually, all of the voltages and currents in our circuit here, and we're just going to look at a simple series circuit to start. Um, they're all sinusoidal, and so that's pretty easy for us to handle. We don't have to set up any differential equations or anything. What we're going to do is we're going to expand our solution space from real numbers into complex numbers. And when we do that, that will allow us to use a concept called phasers. And these will allow us to analyze AC circuits purely algebraically. We don't have to set up differential equations or do anything uh, too difficult. Okay, so uh, that's the idea there. Um, what do we use for AC uh, sources? We use this symbol right here. So this symbol right here, this is an AC source. Okay. Um, this could be an AC current source or it could be an AC voltage source. We're always going to assume that this is an AC voltage source. Um, so whenever we write down a symbol like this, we mean that we have uh, an AC voltage there. And, you know, typically that AC voltage is going to be given, be given some information about that, right? And we'll start from there. Okay. Um, one of the assumptions that we'll make is that our current always has this form right here. Okay. So we'll always assume, always assume that the current has this form right here. And we reference all of our other functions with respect to this function here. So 
what you'll see is we'll write down the voltage in terms of the current plus some phase angle. Since we know that the voltage is going to be some sort of sine or cosine, um, it might be uh, shifted to the left or to the right a little bit, and it might be scaled up or down depending on the coefficient. So we'll always assume the current uh, has this form. Okay, are we clear so far? Have I been rambling and not writing too much? Is everything I've said so far make, making sense? So we haven't really gotten into anything, but I've been doing a lot of talking and not much writing. Is everybody following me? I'll write a lot of this stuff down as we move forward. So just trying to spell out what we're gonna be doing for the rest of the section here. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get into it now. Um, phasers. This is the first, uh, well, maybe the second topic now. So phasers. What are phasers? Phasers are uh, complex representations of the solutions for the current, the voltages, the the parameters of our circuit. So they're complex uh, numbers. We can always think of complex numbers as two-dimensional vectors. And the book tries to sweep the complex numbers under the rug. And um, that's okay. But I do wanna mention that these that this idea comes from complex numbers because it's very important for the overall conceptual understanding why we're doing it, right? Um, and there's a really nice, uh, there's some really nice relationships that come out of that, that yes, you can understand them in terms of vectors, but we're not actually working with any vector quantities. Everything we're working with is a scalar. So it makes more sense to look at it from the complex plane rather than um, as vectors. Okay, so the entire basis of phasers, which I have not explained yet, um, is the idea of complex numbers here in a complex plane. Now, how do we get there? We get there by Euler's identity. The exponential function raised to the complex, uh, or rather raised to the imaginary unit I times some angle theta um, is cosine theta plus I sine theta, right? Hopefully everybody has seen this expression before. If you haven't, everything will still hopefully make sense to you, um, but you really wanna do a little extra reading on it in the book just to make sure that you've grasped the concept uh, well enough, okay? Um, and what I mean by I here is not current, actually electrical engineers don't use I for the imaginary unit, they use J. We're gonna avoid that because in your math classes, you've seen I, not J. So I squared here is minus one. This is the imaginary unit. This is the imaginary unit. Right, and so if I were to plot this in the complex plane, I have imaginary, I have real. Here is I right here. This is minus I down here, right? Let's draw that a little bit better, minus I. Over here we have one, which is a real number. We have minus one, which is also a real number, okay? So we have an imaginary axis, we have a real axis. You can see from the definition that we have a real part, cosine theta, and we have an imaginary part, sine theta, right? Um, by convention here, uh, when you take the imaginary part of, um, I guess it, in either, either way, uh, let's just include the eye here. Maybe it's less confusing if we include the eye here. The imaginary part is the part that's attached with the eye. Right. Um, whether or not the imaginary part, if you take the imaginary part of this function here, if you just get sine theta or if you get I sine theta is up for debate. We only care about the real part. 
So if I write something like the real part of e to the i theta, this is what we care about here. My answer is cosine theta. That is the only part of e to the i theta that does not have the imaginary unit i, okay? This is called Euler's identity. Those of you who maybe haven't seen this before, um, I hope everybody's seen this, but this is called Euler's identity. Very famous, um, very famous formula, which you can use to bring, you know, um, complex numbers, transcendental numbers, and um, like pi, right? Um, if I plug in theta here, if I have e to the i pi, cosine of pi is minus one, and sine of pi is zero. So e to the i pi is equal to minus one. Okay, so this is like a famous um, formula bringing e, i, pi, and minus one all together into one nice little neat formula. Okay, but what we need here is just the real part of e to the i theta is the cosine part. So now this is where we take a step back to the physics. So we want to translate this to our situation. And it'll become very clear why we're doing this shortly um, when we actually write down what the phasers are. So if I were to take my current I of T, let's write this down, I cosine omega T, okay? I could think of this current as the real part of a complex current. So I could say, well, suppose I have a current capital I of T, which is equal to I, capital I, times E to the minus, sorry, not minus, times E to the lowercase I omega T. Again, this lowercase I right here is the imaginary unit. That's why I haven't written I of T. I'm trying to be really careful about that. Let me know if I mess up, okay? Um, so this capital I of T is equal to the amplitude, capital I, times E to the lowercase i imaginary unit, omega T. And if I were to take the real part, by the way, this is equal to then capital I times cosine omega T plus I sine omega T, If I were to take just the real part of this, I would end up back with the lowercase i of t. Okay, capital I cosine omega t, which is the same as this one right here, right? So let me go ahead and write that last step there. Okay, so why would we want to do this? Let's now jump into this idea of a phaser. Okay, now we can graphically look at um, we can graphically look at what's going on here by uh, drawing the phaser diagram here. So first, draw yourself a complex plane like so, and the positive side is um, the part where the, the first quadrant here is the quadrant we're going to focus on for now. Um, we have a current I cosine omega t, which is real. And we're saying, let's imagine for a second that that current is a complex current, but we're going to take the real part of it. So this is our I of T, the complex current. And the projection of that current down onto the horizontal axis, the real axis, that is our lowercase I of T. Okay. 
So you can really see the similarities here between vectors already, right? But let's keep going with this complex numbers idea for a little bit more until we've completed it. The angle here in the complex plane is omega t, right? That's what's inside the cosine, cosine omega t. So the angle there is omega t. Now, when we project onto the real axis, that's the real current that that flows. Okay, so that's what we would measure. We cannot measure a complex current. We can talk about a complex current as a mathematical tool that can help us solve problems, and it will help us solve problems, as we'll see shortly. It's actually a very useful tool. But the only thing we can really measure is the lowercase i of t. Okay, so keep that in mind moving forward. The complex part, this is the phaser. Okay, this is what we call the phaser. In fact, this is the current phaser. So let's even go further. This is a current phaser. We're going to have voltage phasers and um, uh, yeah, voltage and current phasers. That's uh, and also maybe impedance for resistance um, <clears throat> when we get there, though. So this is the current phaser. It's simply a complex number that we've kind of drawn almost like a vector in the complex plane. If you look at the diagrams in the book, and I will show those diagrams, we will actually pull some figures from the book. They are hiding from you the fact that the horizontal axis is a real axis and the vertical axis is uh, in the imaginary axis. Okay, so you might go and read the book and you know, like, what's going on here? Is this like an X and a Y? Is this a, is this I versus T? right what is the what is actually being plotted here well now you have the answer it's a complex number that is being plotted and that's why they've left the axes off uh, of the or they've left the labels off of the axes to kind of avoid talking about the complex numbers okay so we've established that are there any questions um who's seen complex numbers before has, has people have people not seen complex numbers before we're not actually going to go deep into complex numbers but we want to understand this concept of phasers give me a thumbs up if you understand what we've done so far if you have a question please ask your question before we get so deep into this that we're all lost. Okay, so maybe two people have not given me a thumbs up. Lick and um, Anastasia, do you have questions? Okay. Don't be scared to slow me down here because um, this first bit uh, of the lecture here is the foundation. So we wanna make sure we have a good foundation uh, it's all math. There's not much physics to go on here. So it, um, you know, we want to make sure we understand it. Now that we've spoken about phasers for uh, just, just briefly about phasers, we're going to take a slight detour and talk about average current. It's a slight detour. We don't need the phasers for this, but we're going to come back to the phasers in a second. A natural question you might ask yourself is if I have a function and I'll use lowercase i of t, this is the real current. If I have a function which describes my current, it has some amplitude capital I, that's for example, the maximum current that would flow um, times cosine omega t. Is there a way to um, take an average of this current that's meaningful. Okay, so, so averages for AC. Let's get a little header for this topic here. So averages for AC. So if I just go in blind and take an average like you might take in a calculus one class, right? Um, one over the period uh, of the function. Okay, sorry, um, I should say one over some length 
uh, we're calculating the average of a, let's actually establish this maybe in general. So let me say, okay, suppose we have a function f of x, okay, uh, we don't know what f of x is, and we want to calculate, um, we want to calculate uh, f of x average, so f average um, on some interval, on the interval from zero to a, for example, then the way that we would do that is we would write down an integral over that interval, integral over the interval, and divide by the length of the interval. So I would do one over a integral from zero to a um, f of x prime, let's put it, well, no, we don't need, we don't have another x here, so that's good. Okay, so f of x dx. So we'd integrate f of x from zero to a, and then we would divide by the length of the interval. So the length of the interval in this case is a, a minus zero. And this is a standard averaging technique because it takes into account the fact that the function could spend more time at certain values or in certain ranges than other values, right? If you have a linear function, you just take the two endpoints and just calculate the average, right? The endpoint one plus endpoint two divided by two and you'll get the correct average. Um, but for functions which are a little bit curvy, you have to be a little bit more careful about your average, right? You have to take an integral and sum up each of the contributions to the average weighted by the value of the function um, on that interval and then divide by the length of the interval. Okay, so that's how you do it for just any arbitrary function of x on some interval. The natural thing to do for a periodic function is to calculate the average on one period. So a is equal to t here, which is one period, and we integrate from zero up to t for one period. And so we would do we would do so like this. So i of t dt. But we pretty quickly run into an issue with this kind of average, the most natural average, so to speak. And that is that if I were to integrate a sine or a cosine over um, over a full period, I would get for my answer zero, right? Can we all understand why we would get zero for that? Well, let's do a quick plot to really illustrate it. Um, a cosine looks like this, right? And it spends just as much time above the uh, above the horizontal axis as it does below the horizontal axis, right? So we can see that the average here, if we, for example, let's look, let's maybe we don't even have to look at the cosine, but maybe it's better to look at this portion right here, which is basically a negative sign. The area here is equal to the area here, right? And so when I sum up all of the areas, I'll get zero. Now for this particular cosine, okay, we have to be a little bit more careful. So one period, uh, one period is from here. Let's try and draw a straight line there, here to here. And so this area plus this area is gonna be equal to this area right here. So the total area there is zero for the integral. So when we average a sine or a cosine, I think it's clear we are gonna get zero. Another way to think about it is whenever you have a sine or a cosine, find the middle line for that sine or cosine. So suppose I have, um, suppose I have a sine or cosine, which is like this, which is going to come up later. So it just kind of goes up and down. It kind of kisses the, the horizontal axis and then just kind of goes back up like that. Then the average of this thing is smack dab in the middle. So if this right here is the amplitude, if that's the, the um, uh, I shouldn't say amplitude, let's uh, use, because uh, that's half of that is the amplitude. Um, let's say uh, this is, let's say this is the max value here. Then this right here, the average would be the max value over two, 
So if we had a way of converting this cosine in our case into something that looks like this, we could take its average. Okay. How are we going to make this thing look like this? Well, I mean, I think it's kind of silly if we were to just, let's say, add one to our current, right? If we just like, or add I, for example, to make the cosine, the I times cosine omega T, excuse me, come up above the horizontal axis. So what options do we have? Um, because zero is not useful for us. We can't make calculations with zero because we just keep getting zero, right? So the idea um, that uh, one might uh, use here is the idea of a root mean squared average. And we'll quickly see the applications of the root mean squared average. For now, we're just doing math. Like I said, we're gonna do a lot of math here to kind of start things off. But eventually we'll start to see the applications. We'll start to see the usefulness of the root mean squared average. Just right off the top of my head, when I plug something into the wall, I know I'm getting 120 volts RMS, root mean squared. So the actual amplitude of the sinusoidal wave that you get from your wall outlet is not 120 volts. Um, it's uh, 120 volts RMS. So that is not the same as the amplitude. You have to multiply the RMS uh, value by the square root of two to get the um, uh, to get the uh, the amplitude. So 100, I think it comes out to like 180 something volts is the amplitude that you get from your wall outlet. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, there's a nice little trick: the root mean squared average, like I mentioned there. So root mean squared average. or RMS for short, you'll hear me say RMS um, every now and again, and that means root mean squared. Um, it means we've taken an average of a quantity according to what I'm about to spell out for you guys. So in order to write root mean squared, we put RMS as like a subscript. Um, we might have more subscripts. We might have like I sub R like for resistor and then comma RMS. And even in some books, uh, especially in, in circuits books and other electrical engineering topics, um, it's implied that when you write down a quantity, that that quantity is a root mean squared value. So um, it's important to kind of understand that, um, you know, the, the root mean squared is is everywhere and sometimes you won't even see the subscript because it's it's just implied that that's what it is. So uh, we want to we really want to understand this part so root mean squared it's exactly what it sounds like root. I'm going to take the mean, which is the same as the average that we just saw. So the here's the square root and then the average, which is mean mean means average. And then of the quantity squared. And in this case, we have I of T. So I of T squared. Let's put the square in the middle there. Let's uh, try to make some space for that. Um, so put the I here and put the square there. And then so it's I squared as a function of T. So it's from outside in, right? Root mean squared. Uh, RMS average. The average, the thing in parentheses here with the subscript average, that's the standard calculus average. So this translates to, in all its glory here, I'll write it down one time, an integral, um, or sorry, uh, divide by the period, integrate from, for one period, um, the function squared. So I squared as a function of t, which literally means just take the current and square it. And that is our root mean squared average there. Okay, 
So again, it's just a lot of math to start things off. Okay, now let's go ahead and actually um, set this up. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to vary. It's simple calculus one type of integral. Um, you don't even need calculus two to do this integral because it's just a trig identity, right? You just use a trig identity and you can do the integral. Um, so probably have maybe even seen it in Calc 1, depending on your teacher. But basically, here's the idea. We square the function because it's going to make these negative values positive if we square it. But we're going to square. So this peak is going to go up. So the peak is going to come up like this. And then this peak is going to get squared as well. And then up like this and so forth, right? So this is what the um, square of the function looks like uh, in black there. Uh, you can also think of it as just this one right here. So cosine squared of omega t. So one over the period integral zero, so integral over the period. And then we have i big I squared, which is just a constant. That's just the amplitude of the current, the maximum value the current is ever going to take. Cosine squared omega t dt. And that is where I will stop. You can do that integral. I'll pull the I all the way out of the integral. The amplitude of the this cosine here is a strictly positive number. You wouldn't put a negative value for, for the current by convention, right? Um, so we just pull that out. No plus or minus, no magnitude necessary there. And then what's left over is what's inside this square root. Okay. So you are going to go ahead and verify that for yourself. Um, you may need to use a power reduction rule, the trig identity. So use, so you can just look that up, right? So power reduction to be able to do this integral. Okay. Um, so once you've done that, then it's just going to become a simple um, integral of a sine or a cosine. Um, depending on actually how you choose to approach the integral. Uh, but your final answer that you're going to get there is uh, 1 over 2 for the integral, so 1 half, and then the square root is going to make that a root, uh, 1 over root 2, right? So i, which is the amplitude of the current divided by square root of 2, is the RMS current. And I will now simply use capital I RMS because the lowercase um, I RMS, this is not a function of time. Um, so let's go ahead and just revert back to the capital letter notation, right? So lowercase letter for when it depends on time, right? Just following the book. Um, we'll go back to capital I. Now, um, a lot of the analysis that we'll be doing will involve RMS quantities, which do not depend on time. And as we'll see, you can actually pretty easily go from the RMS quantities. So suppose you know all the RMS quantities for a circuit. It's actually fairly easy to go from the RMS quantities back to the functions of time. It's actually not that difficult. You would think that might be something that's pretty difficult to do, right? To go from, you know, some, you got a bunch of numbers that have no time dependence and then get the time dependence back in there. That's usually a difficult problem. But um, if you already have the time functions, it's not a big deal to go and get the RMS values. But actually, because AC circuits are so nice to us mathematically, it's actually fairly easy to to take the RMS quantities and get the time functions as well. Okay, any questions about that RMS? We have a nice little figure here that we can um, pull up um, from the book to just really uh, illustrate 
everything all in one little picture here. Everything to just kind of review quickly what we've done for the RMS um, average here. So I'll just bring this into the shot here. So um, you start with this bold purple. Let's go ahead and zoom in on it. So we start with this bold purple um, current first, right? This is the real current that flows in the circuit as a function of time. It has a three amp magnitude, right? And um, on the, at the bottom here, um, this value right here, this minus I, <clears throat> excuse me, they just mean minus three amps there. So um, highest value, three amps, lowest value, minus three amps. And they show you that, um, well, first off, it's clear from the picture, again, the average of this thing is zero if we go in and we just, just kind of blindly apply a standard calculus averaging process, right, uh, technique, um, we end up with zero. So what do we got to do? Well, one thing we can do, and it's not the only thing that we can do, it's certainly we're making a choice by saying let's take a root mean squared average. It's not the only thing that we can do. Uh, there are other averaging processes. Um, in fact, there's one in the book, I believe, but I'm just going to completely skip over that because we won't use it um, for the vast majority of our analysis. Um, so once we square that thing, what happens is all the negative values become positive and um, the, uh, it, it almost looks like the function is shifted upwards now, right? Um, and it has uh, a period which is half as big, right? And the reason for that is because when you square a cosine, right, you have a power reduction rule, which gets you to something which has um, twice the angle on the inside, right, of the uh, argument. So um, now once we've squared the thing, it's clear where the average lies. If the square is nine amps squared, but we can just think of it as just numbers. If the square is nine, then the average is 4.5, right? So the average of I squared is 4.5. Now, what do we have to do? We just have to undo the square. So we took the square, we averaged. Now let's undo the square by taking a square root. So the average here is 4.9 and that's this line right here. That's the midpoint of the um, of the current. So 4.5 amps. And then this right here is the square root of 4.5. Um, uh, 4.5 amps. Okay, so that's what that current is right there. And that's the, this is the RMS current. And again, uh, if I know the amplitude of my current, which in this case is three amps, I can get the RMS current by doing three over square root two. And if you algebraically manipulate this square root of 4.5, you will find that that is the same as, um, as three over square root two. Okay. Um, that's good for uh, RMS, I believe. So are there any questions about that? Go and fill in the gaps um, later after uh, class. You can revisit um, some of those integrals that we kind of skipped over and uh, go ahead and work through those yourself. Now, of course, we can apply the same concept to voltage. So the RMS voltage, the RMS voltage is simply the magnitude of, uh, of the voltage, whichever voltage you're talking about. So if you're talking about the voltage on the resistor, you might put a subscript of capital R here and say the amplitude of the voltage on the resistor or across the resistor divided by square root two is the RMS voltage across the resistor. So anytime you want to convert from amplitude to root mean squared, simply divide by square root two, or if you want to go the other way from RMS to amplitude, 
you simply multiply by square root two. It's as simple as that. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next topic if there are no questions. So give me a thumbs up if you're good. We'll be revisiting phasers shortly and expanding on that idea. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move into the next topic, which is resistance and reactants. And once we've established what we mean by reactants, we can revisit this idea of phasers and really see what's going on there. Okay, so resistance, resistance and reactants. The entire goal of this next section is to establish this idea of reactants and how we can um, how we can build a relationship between uh, an Ohm's law type of relationship um, between voltage and current for inductors and for capacitors. That's the goal of this next section. So to kind of write down something that looks like Ohm's law for capacitors and inductors. And of course, we don't even necessarily know at this stage if that's something that we can do. But of course, I'm kind of... Um, <clears throat> Of course, I'm kind of um, uh, leading leading to that idea, right? So you know what's coming. Uh, Sarah, where do you, uh, you're still copying? Is this good right here where I'm at? Okay. All right, so uh, resistance is something we understand fairly well. So if I have a voltage across a resistor V sub R, then of course I will have current flowing through that resistor and that current uh, flow and uh, the voltage across the resistor are of course proportional and the proportionality constant is the resistance by definition and the resistance is constant for ohmic materials and that essentially means conductors and it uh, means conductors who don't have so much current flow that their temperature is increasing by uh, an appreciable amount. So um, if you have Ohm's law, it's real easy to work the time dependence into the equation. Simply insert a function of time for your voltage and insert a current as a function of time uh, for the current, so insert the time dependence for the current as well, basically. And you have Ohm's law now as a function of time. Again, assuming that the resistance doesn't change over time, for example, a light bulb is already an example where the resistance changes over time and uh, breaks Ohm's law a little bit um, until it reaches steady state. Um, so Ohm's law, we can clearly see if we have a current here, if we if, if our if our current um, if our current is a function of time, if I of t is uh, capital I uh, cosine omega t, then that would imply that our voltage on the resistor, and let's use a lowercase v actually, the voltage on the resistor as a function of time is then going to be the amplitude of the current times the resistance times cosine of omega t. Okay. The um, implication here from the standpoint of the phasers, we can actually write down a phasor diagram specifically for um, the voltage and current flow in this particular resistor here. So I will show that now as a picture from the book here. And let me scroll down a bit. Uh, maybe I can put it here and it fits. Here's our phasor diagram for, um, uh, we have now a resistor, like imagine a circuit, 
where we have just a resistor at this point and a source of alternating current. So the current in the circuit is I cosine omega T, which we can see in purple. So the complex uh, current, that's the capital I here, that's the one that we can't, me we can't measure a complex quantity. Um, so there it is right there. And then the current uh, down here, the darker purple is the real current. That's the one that we can measure. Okay. And we have now the voltage on the resistor in the dark red here. The voltage in the dark red is the real voltage. That's the one that we can go in with a voltmeter and measure. And that one is simply the, um, the magnitude of that one is simply the current amplitude times the resistance. And uh, which is kind of bizarre actually how they've drawn it here now that I'm looking at this for the second time for, for you guys. Um, perhaps they should have, they're, they're probably doing it because they want to layer the diagrams, but perhaps they should have had the V's bigger than the I's because usually R is a number that's much bigger than one, right? But um, in any case, that's fine. Um, and then this lighter red color here is the voltage phaser. So again, that is a complex representation of the voltage, which uh, has as its real uh, part the real measurable voltage. So in this case, the phaser V sub R as a function of T is uh, I times R uh, E to the I omega T. Okay. And again, if I could just write this, uh, you know, and this is a phaser here, I could just write this again um, in terms of Ohm's law. You could literally, you could just read it off from here. Like this equation works with phasers right here. So if you wanna write that down, this works for phasers. And obviously it has to, right? Because if I take the real part, um, if I just take the real part of it, all I've done is multiplied by a real number R, right? The resistance is a real number. So if I multiply by R, I haven't, um, I haven't uh, changed um, uh, the real part except by that factor of R, right? So if I take the real part on both sides, of course, I'll get um, the, the same thing. Okay, um, so the magnitude again is scaled by R. So if R is less than one, of course, the voltage phaser would be smaller as it's shown here in the diagram. But if R is much bigger than one, right, then the voltage phaser be bigger in magnitude than the current phaser. Notice that the functional dependence of the um, two phasers, uh, well, rather these are the, okay, of the real current and voltage um, is the same. It, they both depend on omega t, right? Um, these are said to be in phase. So they rotate together, right? Anything, uh, uh, it's omega t, right? So this thing should be rotating. You can clearly see here the angle is omega t, right? Um, Oftentimes when we look at phaser diagrams, though, we don't, we don't even care about the rotation. We don't even care about the rotation. We just choose the current to be somewhere in quadrant one and everything else, um, everything else basically follows from that. Um, so uh, what we'll see shortly is that uh, voltage, uh, voltages and currents that run uh, through capacitors or inductors are actually um, not in phase, but they're out of phase by 90 degrees. And so we'll, uh, we'll also illustrate that as well when we get there. So that's resistance and a little bit of phasers for current and voltage uh, through and across a resistor. Now we want to look at, let's, let's take a look at inductors next. Okay. Um, for an inductor, we have a relationship between 
um, voltage and current. And that is that the EMF in an inductor is L D I D T. Okay, L D I D T. And um, you'll notice that I've left the minus sign out of the expression here. And I think the reason that they do that is uh, in the book uh, just simply because um, the polarity of the voltage on the inductor opposes the source. And so um, if you go around, uh, if you go around uh, a closed loop and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, then what happens is you'll have a minus sign and then you'll plug in for the voltage minus L D I D T and those minus signs cancel. And so since we're looking specifically at the inductor, we, uh, we just drop that minus sign out. And, um, but you'll see a minus sign come back in here in a second. And that minus sign is very important and we'll show exactly what happens with it here in a second. So um, we have this inductor and we have, a, we have an AC, uh, an alternating current, right? So if we have an alternating current, here's our current as a function of time here. So I of T again is I cosine omega T. And we want to plug this in to the derivative. And I also want to ditch this notation of EMF and just go back to um, our lowercase uh, letters here. So subscripted with a uh, L for inductor, right? So the voltage as a function of time across the inductor is the inductance times the time derivative of the current, the rate of change of the current. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So um, I guess we can leave this in orange here if we want. So this is going to be equal to L d by dt of I cosine omega t. Just throwing in this step here. Um, we can pull the I out of the derivative. So L I and then the derivative of the cosine omega t. When we take the derivative of a cosine, as I mentioned before, kind of towards the beginning, we get minus sine. Hopefully all of you are good on that, but we can't forget the chain rule. So we need to multiply by omega, the derivative of the inside, right? Omega t is omega. So we end up with omega li and then minus sine of omega t. Okay. Um, and that minus sign is uh, quite important because it tells us how to write this, um, this function in terms of cosine. So um, I mentioned already once that um, when we have uh, a sine or a cosine, we can recover the other one by, where did I, I, yeah, I wasn't looking there. I was looking, yeah, it was somewhere up here. Yeah, right. So um, I think, yeah, right here. So I can redraw this, um, but basically if you look at the blue one here, um, I can shift this point here over and I can, sh and, and I can look at it as, um, as a negative sign here. Right, so a cosine is a negative sine, but shifted. Right, um, so let's go ahead and do a new drawing just to make sure that it's it's clear. So if I have uh, my coordinates like this, and this is my uh, cosine here, then a sine is simply a shifted cosine, right? And I might not be drawing this perfectly accurately here, but um, bear with me on this. So uh, if I were to shift the cosine uh, 
to the right, if I shifted it this way, then I would get a sign. If I shifted it the other way, I would get a negative sign. Okay, I'll get a negative sign. Um, so the uh, negative sign here, um, it works out to omega L uh, I and then cosine of omega T, I believe it is plus 90 degrees here. Uh, let me think about that for a second. So we have to plug in larger values of omega t if we add 90 degrees. So if we're here, the negative sign begins right here. So if I have to plug in, uh, no, I, I believe it should be minus 90 degrees. Um, yeah, it has to be minus 90 degrees. Yeah, so that I plug in larger values of omega t. I think I said it backwards the first time I said it. So if I subtract 90 degrees, then that shifts my function to the left, right? So maybe some of you remember from like, I think, what is it like pre-calculus? You talk about stuff like this, like shifting the functions. So if I shift that point there, I can shift it to the left. Um, 90 degrees by subtracting 90 degrees. So my negative sine omega t is the same as a cosine omega t minus 90 degrees, which means I have to plug in a larger value of omega t to get um, uh, to get the, the point. Um, this like, for example, this black point right here. So I have to plug in a value of omega t, which is bigger than zero, right, to get that point. You can see that in a phasor diagram as well. So let's take a look now at the phasor diagram for the inductor. Here it is. We can leave it right here. Uh, maybe actually I want a little bit more space to write on both sides, so let's put it a little bit in the middle. Okay. So notice that omega t is larger for V sub L. This is omega t for V sub L, right? A larger value of omega t means that the voltage phasor leads the current phasor. Okay, so we say that the voltage leads the current when the voltage is rotated counterclockwise so counterclockwise rotated for leads so when we say the voltage leads the current phasor it means the voltage is rotated counterclockwise and as a special case for an inductor, the phase angle is 90 degrees. That will not be the case for the voltage source, okay? Do not make that mistake. It will not be rotated by 90 degrees for the voltage source. We will show how to deal with that shortly. Again, you can see the complex nature here of the uh, phaser, right? So it's rotated over into this plane here, or sorry, this quadrant, I mean. Um, it has an imaginary portion to it, but the real voltage on the inductor is of course negative if we have positive current flow through the inductor, right? That's Lenz's law, that the voltage will oppose the, the flow of current. Um, so uh, V sub L, lowercase V sub L, is in the negative direction. So it's a negative real number because it opposes the positive flow of current. Again, that's Lenz's law. Um, again, uh, the real portion is the part that we can measure. We can't measure capital V sub L, the phaser. We can only measure that, um, that portion along the real axis there. So to remind everyone again, the nature of things here are we have real numbers on the horizontal axis, 
and imaginary numbers along the vertical axis, something we cannot escape. Okay, uh, well, we can escape it if we want to do hard problems, we can escape it. But if we want to do easy problems, we introduce phasers. So we expand into the complex plane. Okay, more on leading, like voltage leading current. You could also say current lags voltage. That's another way of, uh, so if voltage leads the current, you could say the current lags the voltage. Who would have known the word lag predates games like League of Legends and so on. Okay, um, next we wanna tackle uh, the reactants of the um, inductor here. I mentioned we were going after an Ohm's law relationship. So Ohm's law might look something like this. So V sub L of T is equal to uh, omega L I times again, this cosine or sine. So sine minus sine omega T um, close the parentheses. Um, what quantity here uh, do we have to work with? Um, well, I look at this expression, I see functions of time. That makes things a little bit difficult. Let's try to get rid of the functions of time, right? Let's take a root mean squared average on both sides. If we take an average on both sides, we'll get zero. Right? We have a sine omega t. If we take an average, we'll get zero. So let's take a root mean squared average. Oh, whoops, I scrolled up on accident. So on the left side, we would have VL, RMS. And feel free, um, feel free to change how you write these things. Like uh, I might write VL comma RMS, or I might write something like VRMS and maybe put an L up here. Use superscripts and subscripts to keep things organized, right? Whatever you're comfortable with, um, right? Whatever notation works best is the, for you is the best notation usually, right? As long as it's understandable. Um, so if we were to take the root mean squared average on both sides, all of these constant terms pull out of that root mean squared average. And we simply need to calculate the root mean squared average of sine omega t with a minus sign. Of course, we already know the answer. That is one over square root two. So omega L I R M S. We can use that square root of two to combine with the I that's there. I is the amplitude. I divided by square root two will give us I R M S. And now we can see an Ohm's law relationship. The Ohm's law relationship here is the voltage is proportional to the current for RMS values. And this is the proportionality constant. We call this reactance to differentiate it from resistance. You can think of reactance uh, as a complex version of resistance which is really what it is. It's a complex version of resistance due to the nature of the sinusoidal alternating current. Um, in, in fact, it's even, it's even uh, better than that because um, as, we move, as we move forward, uh, we'll eventually get to the concept of impedance. And impedance is like a complex, it's like a, the, it's a more general um, version of reactants. So it's going to include reactants, it's going to include resistance and so forth. And actually there is a fundamental constant uh, in nature which tells you the impedance of the vacuum. So if you're ever wondering, you know, where, like, why did I learn complex numbers in my algebra class? You know, where am I, where am I ever going to use them? Um, if you're headed in the direction of physics, math, you know, uh, electrical engineering, probably mechanical and civil engineering at some point as well. I mean, 
complex numbers have real world applications and we're seeing that unfold right in front of our eyes, right? So it's very important to have a good grasp on complex numbers. Remember that a lot of the math that you learn is simply a tool for you to solve real world problems, right? And no, the, the people who were first, um, you know, first publishing about complex numbers had no idea what they would be useful for, right? But eventually people come along and they find applications for these things. Okay, so that's also a, a very good piece of advice for any students who are headed in the direction of research, not necessarily, you know, like working in industry. I mean, you could be doing research working in industry as well. But, um, you know, oftentimes you're researching a particular problem and you uh, have no idea what the applications of your research are going to be until some person, you know, maybe 20, 30 years later comes along and figures out that, oh, this actually applies in many different areas, right? So um, it's always important to learn these uh, tools um, and keep them in, in your toolbox. Uh, as we progress, um, we're going to do the same analysis here for a capacitor and define the um, reactants for capacitor as well and have an Ohm's law relationship for uh, capacitors. So just to, to complete the picture here, our Ohm's law, so to speak, it's not really Ohm's law, right? We had to go into like the complex domain and all this to, to, to make this work, to make it look like Ohm's law. But um, it's not really Ohm's law, but we'll refer to it as Ohm's law probably pretty frequently. Um, is simply the voltage RMS equal to the current RMS times the reactance of the inductor. And the reactance of the inductor is uh, omega times its inductance. So omega, again, is the angular frequency, right? So we've seen that already. Uh, you guys remember omega band, right? If you have a rotating current loop in a magnetic field, you can, you can generate an alternating current or you can uh, induce an alternating voltage, right? Which induces an alternating current. Um, so yeah, any questions at this stage here before we move on to capacitors and capacitive reactants? Of course, you can read more about this in the textbook, right? They'll um, talk more about this stuff. Uh, kind of the quote unquote, the meaning of reactants and so forth. Um, so if there's no questions, I think, uh, give me a thumbs up if you're, if we're good to move forward and we'll go ahead and jump into capacitive reactants next. Again, we still got a decent amount of math to do before we can actually do, um, the AC RLC series circuit. Okay. It seems like a couple people still need to write some stuff. Let me know also if you guys need um, a minute or some or so to think about what's going on here. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that was uh, at least 90% of you. So um, we'll go to capacitive reactants next. So same idea here for uh, capacitive reactants. Um, we're going to do the exact same thing, but it's going to be based on the fact that current is defined as an amount of charge that passes through a given surface per unit time. So now we'll take a look at capacitors or capacitive or uh, capacitive. How did I say it? Did I inductive reactants, capacitive reactants? I think it, it is capacitive reactants. Okay, so it's the same kind of kind of deal here, but um, we start from the fact that the current is defined through the charge, right? So dQ dt is the um, the current. And so if we have a current which is um, 
you know, I cosine omega t, then we should integrate that to get the charge. And the charge will allow us to determine the voltage. That's why we want to get the charge. So Q over C is equal to V. Right, so Q over C equals delta V usually is how we write it, right? Delta V. I think we're comfortable enough. We understand that um, voltage is meaningless without a voltage difference, right? So I think now I'm comfortable dropping the delta with you guys. So um, if we know the charge, we can determine the voltage. And since the current is the derivative of the charge, we can integrate to get the charge. Okay, so the integral of I of T prime DT prime from zero to T is going to be Q of T minus Q zero. And for all practical purposes, when we have capacitors in our circuits and the switch is open, right? We haven't yet turned the circuit on. All of our capacitors are going to be chargeless, right? They're not going to have any initial charge. So in just about every application, we can kill uh, Q zero and make it zero. Now, of course, we can also analyze problems when Q zero is not equal to zero, right? That's definitely something that we can do. And of course, you will do that in a circuits class, which I would recommend taking a circuits class if you have space in your schedule, even if you're not going in the direction of um, electrical engineering or just engineering in general. Um, for example, if you're like a math major, or computer science major or something, um, taking a, a like a circuits class can be a pretty fun experience, actually messing around with circuits in the lab and um, just the problem solving in general is, is pretty um, satisfying. Um, but in any case, uh, let's go ahead and continue forward here with this. The integral of the current here, I'll save you. Um, I'll save you the uh, the pain here of, of integrating this thing, although it's really simple. Um, if we have I cosine omega t, then that implies that Q of t uh, will be um, I over omega times sine of omega t. And notice we don't have a minus sign popping up here this time, right? Um, for the inductor, we had a minus sine omega t. For the capacitor, we have a sine omega t. So the rotation of the phaser in the complex plane will be in the opposite direction to the inductor. So the uh, capacitive reactants uh, and the inductive reactants actually work against each other, which is quite interesting and leads to many applications, um, including things like wireless communications. So a uh, very, um, not necessarily an intuitive thing, but um, we'll see in a second here that it is the case. I mean, it, we can already see it at this point if we have a little bit of experience with phasers, but I'll show the picture here in a second. Once we have the charge, we need the voltage. So the voltage on the capacitor plates across the capacitor, the capacitor plates is VC of T is I over omega C sine omega t. And once we have this, now again, we follow the same procedure as last time. We take the root mean squared average. I'll go ahead and do it all the way over here on the far. Actually, let me save that space for the phaser diagram. We'll come over here. So, and then this implies that uh, V um, let's do a superscript this time, V sub C RMS, or sorry, V super C sub RMS uh, is equal to I RMS divided by omega C. And now we see that the uh, capacitance and the, um, uh, the uh, angular frequency are both dividing, right? They're dividing instead of multiplying. This actually has a very important implication, actually, that I 
didn't get a chance to discuss with my last class, but since we're recording, we'll get a chance to discuss this. The fact that the capacitance is dividing is huge for AC um, circuits. This is actually why AC is so much more dangerous than DC. Um, it's why you can really easily shock yourself by plugging something into the wall. It's actually kind of crazy because what this tells you is that if the capacitance is very low, you have a very high reactance. Your capacitive reactance is extremely high, right? If the capacitance is zero, the, the capacitive reactance is infinity, right? And so that would seem to imply that it is impossible to have a scenario where the capacitance is zero when you have an uh, when you have AC power, when you have an, an alternating current or an alternating voltage, which is quite interesting. So we can again uh, VC RMS uh, is equal to uh, IRMS. Again, we're not putting any subscript uh, any additional scripts super or subscripts on the current. Uh, and I'll talk about later what happens when we have more complex circuits and we, we need multiple subscripts. We're just assuming what, what we're after here is just a simple series circuit first, right? So we're building up all of these tools so that we can analyze a very simple series circuit first. And then we can talk about, okay, what happens if I connect something in parallel here? What's, how, what's going to change, right? So um, the RMS voltage across the capacitor plates is the RMS current times the capacitive reactance. And the capacitive reactance uh, is 1 over the angular frequency uh, times the capacitance of the capacitor. OK, so um, at this stage of the game, we've established two additional Ohm's laws. We've got the regular Ohm's law, right, which we've had for a long time. Now we've we've got, and as a matter of fact, our regular Ohm's law applies for time functions. If my voltage is a function of time, the current is also a function of time. That's, well, is a, is a similar function of time, I should say. It's proportional by R, right? Now, now we've established Ohm's law for root mean squared voltages and currents for an inductor and a capacitor. We have, we do not have any such Ohm's law relationship for the time functions, though. The time functions are related by these different derivatives, right? Um, and so there's no quote unquote Ohm's law relationship for um, inductors and capacitors. So we're stuck with RMS only. And I mentioned before, it's actually going to be fairly straightforward for us to go from RMS quantities to time functions. Whereas that's normally something that might be counterintuitive. If you know averages of a function, you cannot get the function back, right? You have to have a lot more information. And of course, we do have more information. We have the fact that the source is a sinusoidal source, and that heavily restricts us in what we can have for our time functions. They're going to be cosines and sines and possibly have phase angles. And that's it. That's all. Those, those are the only choices that we have. And so it's actually pretty straightforward for us to go from averages to full blown time functions. Okay, um, any questions up to this point? Again, where there's a little bit more math we got to do, we got to look at the phaser diagram for capacitor and so forth. So let's open it up to questions first, though. It doesn't look like we have any questions, but uh, feel free to stop me if we do. Give you another few seconds to think about that. And then we'll talk about the phaser diagram here. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you want me to keep going, if you need a little bit more time. David, 
Lick and Tatiana. Okay. All right. All right. So the phaser diagram for um, a uh, capacitive circuit. So here we have capacitive reactants, and um, and that's about it. So um, I guess uh, not necessarily that's it. But if we are looking specifically at a phasor diagram for the capacitor, this is what it looks like. So we've chosen an arbitrary omega t for our current, right? So there's our current phasor in the light purple. Of course, the real measurable current, the real current is uh, the dark purple. Um, and we have the real voltage and the voltage phasor there, capital VC for the voltage phasor. Notice that the voltage phasor makes an angle 90 degrees with respect to the current phasor, but the voltage phasor lags the current phasor. Okay, And by lags, we mean clockwise rotation. It's clockwise rotated. So when something lags behind, it is clockwise rotated um, when we talk about this like leads and lags. So when it's lagging, it's clockwise rotated. Okay. Um, now, some things to note again, the, um, the voltage on the capacitor here, the real part of it, that dark red vector is scaled down. Um, the real current RMS value, uh, times the capacitive reactance gives you the magnitude there of the real voltage, um, either amplitude or RMS. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, for phasor diagrams, you can scale everything by a factor of root two if you want. So you can talk about amplitudes or root mean squared um, when you're dealing with phasor diagrams. That's not a difficult jump. Um, so um, that's the important part there is that the voltage for the capacitor actually lags behind by 90 degrees. So if the reactant or if the voltage phasor for the inductor is leading by 90 degrees, and we'll see this here in a second, leading by 90 degrees means pointing in this direction, then we can clearly see that the capacitive uh, reactants and the inductive reactants are kind of at odds with one another. They're by, they're different by a relative minus sign, and perhaps a little bit of their magnitude is different as well. So they're, they're anti-parallel. There's a chance that we can cancel them out. And that's going to be important for resonance, as we'll see towards the end of the class. So we still got a, a good amount of way to go before we get there. Okay, so um, just let me quickly think if there's something I missed here. Um, perhaps there is, I feel like I went through that kind of quickly, um, but I think it's good. Um, so again, um, just to remind you, uh, go and read the book, uh, these reactants things. Again, we're dealing with complex numbers and so it's not always clear. You might understand it now as I'm explaining it to you, right? But then it becomes much more confusing later. And you haven't seen it for like a day or whatever. So do read carefully um, the meaning of these things in, um, in, in the textbook. Um, they do have very good explanations for these types of things. Um, let me quickly talk about um, this idea of parasitic capacitance, which is a side topic that I'm making up right now. Um, parasitic capacitance is a real thing. Not to give you an impression that I'm making that up, I just mean this is not in the textbook, as far as I know. Um, parasitic capacitance is um, why AC is so dangerous. Okay. So you imagine you put two parallel metal plates next to one another and you apply a voltage across those two plates, right? And you realize in designing your capacitor that the capacitance goes like epsilon naught um, A over D, right? And the area of the plates 
uh, if the area of the plates is large, then you have really good capacitance, right? And if you can make the distance small, you can make the capacitance uh, really big, right? So um, this works for uh, conductors, but this relationship doesn't necessarily hold for, you know, plates that don't conduct, right? Certainly insulating materials um, do not necessarily um, uh, uh, follow this relationship here. I mean, they can, they can be polarized, yes, but um, can they store a bunch of extra charge on, on you know, if I, if I created some plastic plates, right, and applied a voltage, would I be storing a bunch of charge on those plates? No, I wouldn't be, right? Um, but there is some capacitance there. If I did take two sheets of plastic and connect them to a voltage source. Yes, certainly there is capacitance there. And the capacitance uh, may be very small. And small capacitance means small amount of charge stored, right? Which that seems to fit the logic. If I have plastic plates, I'm not going to be able to store a lot of charge. Therefore, the capacitance must be small. I can apply a large voltage, but I won't necessarily get much charge um, stored on those plates. And then comes along AC, right? So this works for con conducting plates. This works for conducting plates. And if we have insulating plates, so insulating plates, and they don't even necessarily have to be plates. I can take my finger and put it close to the table and there's a capacitance between the table and my fingertip. And that's crucial to this idea here of parasitic capacitance. So insulating plates, you know, C is, you know, C is very small. Um, let's say, uh, let's just say C is small here. Okay. Um, so if I have, a, so if I have like, for example, my finger and I bring it close to the table, there's a small little bit of capacitance there. Okay. And, um, since there is a small bit of capacitance, then there is a large capacitive reactance. Now, of course, the reactance doesn't just depend on the capacitance. It also depends on frequency, right? So if it just so happens that I've accidentally connected my table to the wall outlet, then there is an AC source that's connected to the table, which then sees a capacitive reactance with respect to my fingertip as it approaches the table, and therefore current is allowed to flow between, uh, current flow is, is it, current starts to flow between, you know, my fingertips and, and the plate, right? Alternating current. So the electrons in my skin are now oscillating as the electrons in the tabletop are oscillating. Okay. And this is what makes AC so dangerous because the reactants now, the reactants, capacitive reactants is big. And you might think, okay, well, hold on a second. Capacitive reactants, that's like resistance, right? So big capacitive reactants means that the current flow will be small, right? The current flow will be small because the reactance is big. True. But the fact that the reactance is there allows the current to flow. That's the crucial part, okay? So since XC exists, AC uh, current, well, I guess AC already stands for current, but usually this is what people write. They'll say AC current um, exists. Since uh, XC uh, exists, AC current can flow uh, in ways uh, previously um, 
previously, such as DC, right? In ways previously uh, impossible. Because if we don't have a conductor, then we can't drive a direct current from one place to another, right? Because by definition, if you have insulators, that's resistance to flow of charge, right? Um, but it gets even worse because you can have the, the dependence of the reactants is on frequency as well. Okay, so if I have very high frequency, I can make reactants low, right? So even a situation where the capacitance is very small, so the reactance is large, if the frequency is sufficiently large, then the capacitive reactance comes down and then it's even easier for current to flow in an insulating material where it wouldn't have otherwise been able to flow if it was DC, even if the two were in contact, right? If I take two insulators and I put them in contact with each other, I still can't have current flow DC, but AC, now the game is changed because of this idea of reactance, which is a very real physical thing. Reactance, although it is a form like a type of complex resistance, it is a very real thing. And so, yeah, this this is like this is danger, right? Now things are getting dangerous. This is why you can have crazy. This is why if a bird lands on a power line and um, and and happens to uh, to touch the wrong thing it can just get completely zapped. And in fact, you know, you so much damage can be done that the whole line is taken out right until it's serviced. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, tragedies of things like that happening. Like I remember I saw something recently, I think it, I think it was actually on Reddit where you had just tons and tons of birds landing on the power lines. And um, because of the fact that the bird's feet are so close together, they often don't experience an appreciable amount of current. Um, but when so many of them landed on the lines, it started to weigh the line down so much that it started to cause structural damage to the line. And once that structural damage occurred, then you may have parts of the wire, which is normally insulated are now exposed. And, um, and then, yeah, just the whole, all the birds go up and smoke basically, um, and the line uh, is damaged. So um, a lot of that has to do with AC. That is not to give you the impression that all power lines are carrying AC current, but most of the ones that you see um, in your everyday life actually are carrying AC. So a lot of the power lines out in the countryside are actually DC uh, in order to, um, uh, because I believe for long distance power transmission, um, there are, or, or maybe short distance, I can't remember. Uh, I think long distance, um, DC is a little bit advantageous in terms of efficiency. Um, but for city wiring and stuff, AC is, is far superior. Okay, um, enough of, a, of, a si uh, of an aside there. Um, but essentially, uh, when designing circuits, you always want to be uh, careful about this idea of parasitic capacitance. Um, essentially, what it what it means is that no matter what you do, you are always leaking energy. You're always leaking energy. So energy, um, uh, energy leakage, right? It implies energy leakage. Um, have to be careful about where that energy is leaking to. If it's leaking to the wrong uh, place, then again, like I said, it's dangerous. Okay, uh, hopefully you guys found some value in that. Um, we can go ahead and now recap our toolbox, so to speak, that we have so far. So here's what we have in our toolbox so far that we need um, for analyzing AC circuits. Of course, Ohm's law for resistors. Now we have 
um, reactants. So for the capacitor, uh, we have I times uh, XC. And for the inductor, we have L uh, is I times XL. And we can assume here, I'll just put in the toolbox that this has to be amplitude, amplitude or RMS values here is what you want to use. Of course, Ohm's law applies in general for conductors, right? Um, but you want to use amplitude. Oh, whoops, I misspelled amplitude. You want to use amplitudes or root mean squared, but not both at the same time. You have to pick one or the other. So amplitude slash RMS values only XC one over omega C um, XL um, omega L. And then lastly, I'd like to add, uh, I'd like to add um, two more things to this before we actually uh, start solving problems and, and, and be done with kind of the math portion of the lecture here. One of them is a mnemonic, which we can do right now. Um, the mnemonic is Eli the Iceman. You'll notice I'm writing Eli and ice in caps. Uh, that's because those are the important parts here. Um, that will help us remember what's going on for capacitors and inductors. So E here is EMF or voltage. L uh, is inductor. Of course, I is uh, current. C is the capacitor. Again, E is voltage here, so um, I didn't really need to write that. Let's clean it up a bit. So what does this help us remember? Eli the Iceman. Well, when we're thinking about inductors, we can think about the term that has L in it, right? The L stands for inductance for an inductor. So Eli, I see the word Eli or the name, and I see that the voltage E comes before the current I, E and then I, E-L-I. And so this tells us that voltage leads So voltage leads current in the inductor. For the capacitor, I think about the word ice, Eli the Iceman, okay, ice, I-C-E, C for capacitor. The current leads the voltage. Or you could say the voltage lags the current. Um, and then we can even put that in parentheses here, or the lags, voltage lags the current. Okay. And always by 90 degrees, always, always, always by 90 degrees for these capacitors and uh, inductors here. So we can add that in as well. So Eli, the Iceman, voltage leads the current in an inductor, current leads the voltage in a capacitor. <clears throat> 
maybe. And again, um, we can take a look at what that means for um, a uh, phaser diagram. So we'll go ahead and scroll up here. So sorry, those of you who are copying still, I'll, I'll give you some time if you still need time. So again, um, the voltage here lags the current phaser. The voltage phaser lags the current phaser for a capacitor or the current leads the voltage for a capacitor. Eli, the ice man, ice, current leads voltage. That means voltage lags current. You can see that the voltage is rotated clockwise by 90 degrees. Or you can think of it as a negative 90 degree shift, okay? Negative 90 degree shift. Um, we can look at inductors again. Uh, for the inductor, the Eli, Eli the Iceman, Eli, so voltage leads the current in an inductor because E shows up before I. Um, and that is a rotation counterclockwise by 90 degrees. You can see that in the phasor diagram here, the voltage leading the current by 90 degrees. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so you lie the Iceman, right? Okay, so let's go back down. And uh, anybody who's still copying that, go ahead. I'll give you a little bit, um, give you a little bit of time there. Give, just give me a thumbs up when you're ready to move forward. There is one more quantity we need to add to our toolbox that is called impedance. Okay, one more time, thumbs up if you're ready to move forward. We didn't see everyone last time. Sarah and Munfung, I think you guys gave a thumbs up last time. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and move forward. Again, it's being recorded, so if you need to, you can always revisit the video. I hope most of you are watching the videos. Okay, um, let's in introduce a quantity called the impedance now. Um, in order to do so, we have to kind of combine all of the phaser knowledge that we've learned up to this point into a single phaser diagram. So now we're looking at a situation where, um, where we have a circuit with an AC source, we have the resistor, we have the inductor, and we have the capacitor. R, L, C, just use V for the voltage. So um, if we have every single component here, R, L, and C, well, then in principle, we have capacitive reactants, inductive reactants, and we have resistance. And the combination of those three gives rise to a new idea called the impedance. Okay, At any instant in time, um, the Kirchhoff's voltage law must be obeyed. We cannot simply add magnitudes like the amplitude or the, um, the root mean squared um, values, but what we can do is we can add phasers. And the reason that we can add phasers is because phasers are representations of the time functions themselves in the complex domain. Um, and so by adding the phasers, we can come up with a nice easy way of defining impedance rather than looking at each of the sines and cosines and trying to figure out how do we use double angle formulas and all this junk. Uh, 
to combine all of those to get a single expression um, which has something uh, times the current with like a cosine or a sine and some phase angle, right? So the phasers really simplify the math in that respect. So just breaking down the phaser diagram one more time here. So we fix an angle omega t, um, and that is our current phaser. That is the complex current. Its projection onto the horizontal axis is the real current. Um, the uh, voltage uh, across the resistor is given as I times R, Ohm's law, right? So the, the resistor, uh, the voltage of the resistor phaser is uh, in the same direction. It's in other words, it's in phase with the current. Um, the capacitive reactance is uh, is lagging. Excuse me, the capacitive, uh, so the voltage across the capacitor is lagging behind the current. So it's minus 90 degrees to the current phaser. And the voltage on the inductor is leading the voltage on the, sorry, is leading the current. Um, so positive 90 uh, degree um, angle between those two. And then what we see is a combination of the voltage on the inductor and the voltage on the capacitor, which is kind of intuitive because the two, like I mentioned, are working against one another. So that brown vector there, and now I'll start to highlight the brown vector here, VL minus VC, or really it's a phaser here, um, is a combination of the inductor and capacitor uh, voltages, and they subtract from one another. And because they subtract from one another, what ends up happening is we end up with a voltage, um, or excuse me, we end up with a, uh, another phase angle um, with respect to the current, and it happens to be the source voltage, okay? The voltage that is supplied by the source is making this angle phi with respect to the current flow in the circuit. Um, and, that it, and that phaser is simply the combination of, of, uh, of VR, VC, and VL. Again, Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law always applies at any fixed instant in time. The phasers are representations of the time functions. So as long as we add our phasers, kind of like we would add vectors, right? Complex numbers are like 2D vectors. So we add them up as vectors, we're okay. We're not violating Kirchhoff's voltage law. If we said, however, oh, okay, I have the VL RMS, I have VC RMS, and I have VR RMS, add them all up. No, we're not going to get the right answer. You have to carefully add these things up they are complex numbers, so you can think of them as adding vectors. And what you're going to get is a resultant vector or a resultant complex number. And that complex number is in a new location. It points to a new location in the complex plane, and there's an angle between that vector and the um, current phaser. There doesn't have to be an angle between those two, they can be in phase. The source and the current can be in phase, and that would that would be in a situation we would call resonance. But most often, that won't be the case. Although in many uh, applications, you'll design the circuit in that way. So adding up all of our voltage phasers there leads to a resultant phaser. So V is um, basically uh, the sum of these phasers. So this is a phaser equation. It is not the sum of RMS or amplitudes, um, but it is the sum of phasers. not RMS or amplitude. 
Okay, and we can uh, we can figure out what that phase angle is, and we can figure out how the magnitude of the source voltage um, relates to the magnitude of the um, the current flow in the circuit. And the way that we do that is, of course, by the Pythagorean theorem here. Um, so by the Pythagorean theorem, we can just analyze the triangles here. We can see that uh, the voltage of the source is given by the square root of VL, uh, excuse me, VR squared plus VL uh, minus VC squared. And this equation is not a phasor equation. This is just a geometrical fact about this, these phasors. So this right here, this is RMS or amplitude. Okay. So this one is RMS or amplitude. So notice the two are completely different, right? If we write down a phasor equation in the complex plane, it's just add everything up, right? It's Kirchhoff's voltage law. But in the in the um, the real uh, 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 using the real numbers, which are the RMS voltages or the uh, amplitudes of those voltages, volta uh, the voltages across those elements, we have this strange Pythagorean theorem identity that pops up. So it's not Kirchhoff's voltage law for the RMS values or the amplitudes, it's Pythagorean theorem. But for the phasers, of course, the phasers, uh, those are the time functions. So you can add those up, Kirchhoff's voltage law, no problem. Okay, um, so what do we get when we do this? Well, we have the magnitude of the source voltage. Now what we can imagine is we can say, okay, let's uh, define a new quantity. Let's define a Z quantity called impedance and figure out what the impedance is. And, and essentially what impedance is, is a, a combination of resistance and reactance. So you can think of impedance as a complex resistance, okay? Um, it's got resistance, real R values, and it has these complex reactances as well. So uh, we have impedance, um, which is like complex resistance. And let me put that in quotation marks because again, like when, when I say complex resistance, right, you take that with a grain of salt it's a nice way of kind of thinking about it, but is that really what it is? No, it's not a complex number, right? It's it, impedance is not a complex number. It's a real number, but it's living in this complex world, right? Um, as we all are, right? Um, so for that reason, it's coming from the phasers. So I'll call it a complex resistance. You can think of it in that way in, in a certain sense. Um, how do we figure out what that quantity is, though? Well, we have to remember that the uh, uh, voltage V sub R is I times R, right? So, so I Z is equal to the square root of I squared times R squared plus and now VL minus VC, we have to be careful about this part here. Um, we should plug in I times XC and we should plug in I times XL and then factor out an I squared. So it comes out like this, I squared times XL minus XC here, quantity squared. And I can pull this I outside of the square root as, um, as just I, right? And then we have the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC squared. Take that all under the square root and then cancel I's. And we have our impedance, 
Okay, so z is the square root of r squared plus xl minus xc squared. I'm just writing this one more time. I didn't want to just erase the, uh, the i there. Feel free to just leave the i out in your notes if you want. So uh, there you have it. There's impedance here for this simple series circuit. Now, of course, if we can do something simple like a series circuit, we can expand upon that to more complicated circuits. We can look at a particular branch of a circuit and write down the impedance for that branch. And that works too, right? Um, so yeah, this is the idea here. So now we have an Ohm's law for our source. So, or another way of thinking about it is we have an Ohm's law for an equivalent circuit where we've somehow combined all of our inductors and capacitors uh, into a single element. So we can think of this in the following sense. We have the AC source, we have the capacitor, we have the inductor, right? And we translate this over to something like this, where we have some element which has some amount of impedance and that impedance uh, is given in terms of, you know, R, XL and XC, right? Um, so in a certain sense, it's, it's kind of like an equivalent circuit for an AC circuit with uh, capacitors and inductors. And the only reason we can do that is because we have these uh, well-behaved sinusoidal sources um, technically, you could probably do some of this analysis with uh, um, square waves and triangle waves and things too, but definitely there would be a lot of stuff that, that would come out different. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of like equivalent circuit, but you're able to combine resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Okay. Um, so uh, let's scroll back up a second here and you can see in the diagram, I'll highlight it in orange here, that uh, the phaser there that represents the source voltage is making an angle phi with respect to the current um, phaser I. And that angle phi we can find as the inverse tangent of, um, XL minus XC. Where's my mouse at? Oh, there it is. So we can find um, the phase angle for the source tan phi is XL minus XC over R. Or it's also VL minus VC over R. Right, same, just divide out or multiply by uh, I, R, and S, right? Um, I guess I probably should put uh, a tan phi over here as well. Okay, so two options there to calculate the phase angle. So just take the inverse tangent, right? Um, now we can determine whether the source voltage leads or lags the current. The source voltage is going to lead the current when phi is positive. So if phi is greater than zero, um, I should be really careful. I should say, uh, um, interesting, uh, yeah, angles are tricky here. So, um, if phi is between, let's do it this way. So if phi is between zero and 180 degrees, then, um, then V, uh, leads I. The voltage leads the current. And this is source voltage, so V sub S. Okay. Um, if, and I'll put it negative now. So 
if uh, if phi is less than zero but bigger than minus one eighty. Let's put our degree sign here. Um, then Vs lags the current. Or you could think of it as the current leads the voltage. Okay. So this would be Vs is um, uh, counterclockwise, counterclockwise rotated. And this here is V S is clockwise rotated. And as a matter of fact, um, as a matter of fact, this 180 degree angle is very iffy at best. Um, there is always, always, always a positive resistance in every circuit. So that completely limits the amount that the angle could be out of phase. So, um, oh, actually, uh, Ah, okay, so we can we can actually we can refine this boundary actually we actually so we can make this exact by uh, replacing these with 90 as a matter of fact 90 would be the maximum amount of phase shift that would be a purely reactive circuit so purely inductive reactants or purely capacitive reactants um, so uh, 90 and minus 90 I'm glad I caught that. Um, yeah, so there we go. Now it's now it's it's 100% correct. So it's never the source voltage is never going to be more out of phase than 90 degrees. It's always going to be less than 90 um, in magnitude there. So there we go. Um, that's how the source voltage can lead or lag the current. So those are all of our tools. Again, it doesn't hurt to go over them again. Here's our toolbox. Now we're going to finally be able to do some examples. We have Ohm's law. Okay, why copy this again when I can just copy paste what we already have and add to it? So where's it at? Here's our toolbox here. Copy. Paste. Boom, there it is. Okay, we can add to that. What can we add to that? We can add that the impedance is square root of R squared plus XL minus XC squared. So this is the impedance formula. Um, we can add to this Eli the Iceman, right? Eli the Iceman. Um, ah, and the phase angle, that's right, the phase angle. So we could also add the phase angle here. So tan inverse of XL minus x i'll just write it this one way but just keep in mind you can also use the voltages to get the phase angle okay um good now we're ready to do the rlc series circuit so are there any questions let me know if there are any questions about any of this i know i've been talking for a long time so we have about an hour left of class um, we can get in a decent number of examples, I think, and talk about um, power in AC circuits and resonance, and, and that, that'll be the last two topics. Maybe have time for examples of those as well.
Okay, um, let's get uh, the problem here and I will uh, copy that in. Okay. I guess, yeah, just to zoom in, I guess. Okay, um, here's what we have for our example. What is V sub S? V sub S is the source voltage. So that's the voltage source that we're connecting to the circuit. Um, that's what's supplied to the circuit when we like flip the switch on our circuit. Um, it is a little bit strange that we assume a form for the current, um, but that's just how we do it. That just, I think the analysis is maybe a slightly easier if we assume the current has that form cosine omega T and then figure out the voltage from there. But it's certainly you could do it the other way if you wanted to. Okay, so let me read this question. In the series circuit, suppose R is 300 ohms, L is 60 millihenries, and the capacitance is half a microfarad. The source voltage is 50 volts, and omega is 10,000 radians per second. Find the reactances XL and XC, the impedance Z, the current amplitude I, the phase angle phi and the voltage amplitude across each circuit element. So V here is given to you as a voltage amplitude. Hopefully that is um, apparent from the question here. If they were giving you the RMS voltage, they would probably subscript the voltage like VRMS, right? So the 50 volts here is a, an amplitude. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and those of you watching online will be back in just a minute. Try the problem out yourself. Okay, we're back. So um, I added in a couple more things to do for this example as part of a, kind of a series of examples here. Um, let's go ahead and quickly go over the um, first part here. And you don't want to save time. Um, I'm just going to copy paste some stuff from the example in the text uh, because everybody seems to be uh, working through this first part pretty quick. So um, I think it'll be okay if we do it this way. So to get the reactances, which is what you want to start with, um, XL is omega L and XC is 1 over omega C. It's simply just plugging in the numbers to the formulas that we had. You get 200 ohms for XC, 600 ohms for XL. And in this particular problem, since R is 300, you have a 3, 4, 5 triangle for your Pythagorean theorem for the impedance. So it comes out to a nice number 500. So you can see that there. Um, once you have the two reactances and the impedance, you can go after the voltages. So you can calculate, or excuse me, you can go after the current. Um, and then uh, once you have the current, you can go after the voltages. Um, you can also calculate the phase angle um, once you have the impedance as well using the arctan of XL minus XC over R. To get the current simple ohms law with the impedance V over Z, so 50 volts over 500 ohms. This is the amplitude of the current since they've given us um, they've given us the voltage here. They haven't told us this is the RMS voltage. They've just said this is the voltage. Um, so we would naturally assume that that's the amplitude. Or maybe if they asked us what you know, find the I the, the RMS current, then we would naturally just assume that the V that they've given us is the RMS the RMS voltage. Um, 
sometimes you'll see in some books that, you know, it's just naturally assumed that if there's no subscript or anything, then that is the RMS voltage. Okay. Um, so once you have the current, then it's Ohm's law times three to get the, um, the voltages. So there are the voltages there. So I times R, I times XL and I times XC. So we get 30 volts for the resistor amplitude of the voltage, 60 volts for the inductor and 20 volts for the capacitor. Again, those are amplitude voltages. So I asked a follow-up question just because we haven't really done much with this yet. And that is what is the RMS values for the current and for these voltages here? So if we wanted to get the RMS values, what we would do is we would divide the amplitudes by square root of two. So the I amplitude divided by the square root of two. And um, this, I believe it comes out to something like O point, uh, what is it, 07 amps, something like that. If we just round it off to one sig fig. Um, and I'll let you guys uh, figure out these ones. VL, uh, VR, VL, and VC RMS. Okay. Um, and then the part that I want to go over next was a third part that I added to this example. Getting these RMS values is simply just divide by two, right? It's not that difficult. But um, the next part here seemed to have a little bit of confusion. And that is, how do I get the time functions? So if I want to know I of T, how do I get that? Well, you start with the original assumption that we made in setting up all of these uh, circuit, uh, setting up the analysis for the, these AC circuits. And that was that we had a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal waveform for the current. So the current we're assuming has the form I equals cosine omega T. And I here is the amplitude. So 0 0.10 amps for the amplitude. And then cosine of omega T. Well, omega was given to us as 10,000 radians per second in the problem statement. So if I were to scroll up here, we see that omega is 10,000 rad per second. So it's 10,000 T here. Now, what if I wanted, um, let's say, the uh, voltage on the inductor, just picking one at random here. I'll let you guys fill in the gaps on these. The voltage in the inductor is the current through that inductor times the reactance of the inductor times the same cosine omega t as the current, but it's out of phase by 90 degrees. The voltage leads the current in, um, in an inductor. And since it leads, it is, uh, <coughs> it's um, shifted minus 90 degrees. So it's shifted 90 degrees uh, in the counterclockwise direction. Um, so that might just be something you kind of have to remember, but that comes from the math of using uh, the voltage equals L times di dt and going through that. Okay, uh, you can change this cosine though to a minus sign. You can write this as, you know, if we wanna plug in all the numbers and everything, uh, we can do that um, like this. The reactance for the inductor was 600 ohms. And, um, and then we can write it as a negative here as I've put the negative out in front. Um, and change the cosine with a shift into a sine. But um, when the cosine is shifted like this, minus 90 degrees, uh, you get a, a sine, um, a, a sine uh, omega t. Um, so that would give me the uh, voltage on the inductor as a function of time. So again, you can figure that out for the capacitor and for the resistor. Probably the resistor is the easiest Probably the most difficult one and the one that I'll do next because it's the most difficult is the voltage of the source. So the source voltage 
is I times Z for the magnitude. And then the um, shift is given by that phase angle that we saw before, which is the inverse tangent. So we subtract the phase angle phi here. And phi is not 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees. So this one doesn't change into a sine or a cosine. That's what makes it a little bit tricky. Um, the current, again, uh, 0 0.10 amps. And then the impedance we got was, what was it, 500 ohms, I believe. Uh, yeah, there it is right there, 500 ohms. And uh, multiplied by, again, cosine of omega t. And then we got that phase angle to be 53 degrees. There it is over there on the right side of the screen. So minus 53 degrees. Okay, so um, there you have it. That's how you get the time function. So you just have to kind of remember your original assumptions when you went and derived all these formulas. So we always assume that the current has the form I cosine omega t, and you can figure everything else out from there. Any questions about that? Give me a thumbs up if you are good to move forward. <coughs> Alberto Munfeng, we're good. Alberto. Okay, I'm going to zoom out um, back to our original amount of zoomage here. Um, so now we'll go ahead and scroll down to uh, the next topic here, which is uh, power. We like to talk about power in circuits, right? Delivering power to certain elements. Um, so this is power AC. Power, of course, for um, just any old DC is I times V. And of course, we can carry that over. If we want to look at power as a function of time, we can do current as a function of time times voltage as a function of time. No big deal. Just add in the time dependence there. Um, but it's kind of nice to do a similar procedure to what we saw with the currents and the voltages, namely to take an average, right? Let's get away from the time dependence, just make things a little bit simpler by taking an average um, and looking at the average power. Nice thing about looking at average power is the current is I cosine omega t, right? And the voltage here is um, whatever the amplitude of the voltage is uh, times cosine omega t plus some or minus some phase angle phi, which ranges from minus 90 to plus 90. This is where things maybe get a little bit tricky, but really it's not so bad. If you know your trig identities, you're comfortable with your trig and you're, you know, you you guys have passed calculus too, right? So, I mean, you shouldn't have too much difficulty with this angle addition formula on that second cosine there and uh, combine things. Um, alternatively, what you could do is you could look at a special case for a resistor. So the power, uh, dissipated by a resistor on average is I squared R. And since the current is squared already, we don't have to worry about getting zero for our average. Same situation happens down here. Because we have a real resistor in our circuit, the average power will not be zero. And it all hinges on the fact that this that there's this phase angle here. Um, if that phase angle wasn't there, um, then we might be in a situation where um, um, excuse me, uh, if the um, if we didn't have a resistance in the circuit, this phase angle would be plus or minus 90 degrees. 
And if the phase angle is plus or minus 90 degrees, then this cosine becomes a sine. And if we were to average the product of sine and cosine, we would get zero. Um, but since this phase angle is not plus or minus 90 degrees, it's some value in between, we won't get zero. And in fact, we'll get maximum power when phi is zero. Right. So for the, um, oh, excuse me. So I have to take the average of this thing. So since the current is squared already, what we have on this side is I squared R, and then this, again, this integral one over a period zero to the, uh, integrated over the period of the cosine omega T quantity squared there, DT. And of course we know what that answer is gonna come out to. It's gonna come out to one half. Notice we're not taking a square root, so it's not one over root two. So we end up with I squared R over two. I can make a square root two show up by doing I over root two times I over root two. So the amplitude over root two, what is that gonna be? So question for you guys, what is the amplitude divided by square root two? If you're watching on YouTube, what is the amplitude divided by square root two? Somebody put the answer in chat. So I know somebody knows. What happens when we divide the quantity by root two? We get RMS, exactly, right? So now we have the RMS current squared times R. So if we wanna talk about power, we have to make sure that we use RMS values. If you don't use RMS values, you can't use the same old formulas. Only the value with the RMS quantity has no factor of two. If you use this quantity here, you have to remember that extra factor of two, right? You don't wanna to have to remember that extra factor of two. You wanna just remember I RMS squared times R. So current RMS squared times R, okay? Um, similar thing over here happens, but like I said, I'm gonna to cut to the punchline over here. What ends up happening is I RMS VRMS times cosine of this phase angle. So cosine of phi. This quantity here is called the power factor. If the power factor is one, you're delivering, delivering maximum power to that resistor. If the power factor is zero, you're not delivering any power to the resistor. Of course, that's an impossibility. The, um, the phase angle there, um, uh, yeah, if, if you had a phase angle of zero, you would just have a, uh, you would just have a resistor in your circuit. So, um, uh, excuse me, I, did I, did I, uh, I think I messed up what I said there. Um, no, so, uh, phase angle of zero is maximum power, right? Did I say that the first time? I'm not even sure. I think I, I don't know. I think I messed it up, but Phase angle of zero is maximum power. The cosine is one. Um, so you just have, uh, you just have a, a, a purely resistive circuit. Um, just because you have a purely resistive circuit doesn't mean you can't have inductors and capacitors in your circuit. Um, it just means that the reactances of your inductors and capacitors in your circuit cancel each other out and leaving you with simply uh, impedance equals the resistance which is the condition for resonance, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So uh, again, if you want the formula without RMS, it's I V over two cosine phi, okay? And this quantity right here, the V RMS times the cosine phi, this quantity is the amount of current, or sorry, the amount of voltage uh, the, the component of the voltage phaser that is in the same direction as the current. So if I scroll back up to my phaser diagram over here, notice that the cosine, where's my marker here? The cosine uh, phi times the, um, cosine phi times V here is this component right here. Cosine phi is this black highlighted portion right here. 
which happens to be the same as the voltage across the resistor. Surprise, surprise, the voltage across the resistor is the same as V, um, uh, v times cosine phi the voltage phasor, the source voltage phasor times cosine phi. It's the same as the resistor voltage phasor. All comes from the phasor diagram. Okay, all comes from the phasor diagram. So this thing in pink right here is the same as VR RMS. Okay. Of course, that had to be true, right? I mean, because if I come over here and I see this relationship right here, I squared RMS, I, I should be able to rewrite this, right? I should be able to rewrite this as uh, VR RMS and I RMS, right? The power dissipated by the resistor. I've just put a superscript R there. Um, that's just a superscript, it's not a power. Um, so yeah, power factor is kind of important. It tells you about how much power you're delivering and you're delivering maximum power when the power factor is one, when the phase angle is zero so that the cosine of that is one. Um, now again, the, the phase angle there is limited from minus uh, 90 to plus 90. You can see that right away from this equation here. If, uh, if the phase angle is negative 90, then cosine is zero. If the phase angle is 90, cosine is zero. If the phase angle is bigger than 90, then you have a problem because the power becomes negative. That would mean the resistor is supplying power in the circuit. Of course, that can't happen, right? You can't have a resistive element which supplies power. That's an impossibility. Um, okay, so that's power. So we could now calculate for our previous example, um, we knew that the phase angle was 53 degrees, right? And we know that I RMS was, uh, what was it again? 0 0.07 amps roughly. And then what was V R RMS? Or no, sorry. Uh, what was the voltage? Uh, so it was 50, vo the source voltage. The source voltage RMS. So it was 50 volts divided by square root two, right? So if we zoom in, there's our 50 volts right there. So divide that by square root two, 50 over root two volts. However much that is, maybe somebody put it in the chat earlier. Um, so I can just scroll up here. Um, I see uh, did anybody do the source voltage RMS? We can just quickly calculate it. 35.4. Thank you, Munfeng. 35.4 volts. Um, so if we have the RMS values now, we can compute the power using the power factor. So the power average dissipated by the resistor is 0 0.07 amps times 35.4 volts uh, times cosine of 53 degrees. And what do we get out of that? So I'll go ahead and pull up a calculator over here. And I end up with 1.491 watts. And we should probably round this. Maybe we'll round it up to 1.5 watts, something like that. We do not need to divide by 2 because we are using the RMS values. So when you use the non-RMS values, you have to divide by 2. But since we got these right here, right? These are the RMS values. So if we scroll up, we scroll up over here, we can see why there's a why there's a factor of two in the denominator here, because we did this integral, right? And this integral gave us a factor of one half, 
but then we broke the factor of one half into two square root twos to form the uh, root mean squared values, right? Same thing happens over here when we go from this step. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put the integral here. So there should have been a big integral right here from like one over the period integrate from zero to one period of this thing. And I forgot to write that. So that was a big mistake on my part. Sorry about that. So there should be this integral here. Um, once you go from that step down to the next step there, the same kind of thing happens again. And um, you break down a factor of one half into one over root two times one over root two, and then you form these two RMS quantities. So you don't need the factor of one half when you use RMS values for power calculations. Okay. So um, 1.5 watts, the next natural thing to do would be to double check real quick that this is actually the same. Does this equal the IRMS squared times R? Is it true? Let's check it. So 0 0.07 amps squared. And R was given as what, 300? 300 ohms? Looks like it's going to work out. So this comes out to, let me do it over here, 0 0.07 squared times 300. Yep, 1.47, which we can round. This rounds to 1.5 watts. Perfect. So everything is checking out, right? Everything is checking out. Okay, um, that's power. I've mentioned resonance a couple times now. Your book does not talk much about resonance, but there is like a section in there and it is an important uh, section to understand. So um, despite it being a, a short section, uh, please take that section serious um, and make sure you read that section completely and understand what's going on there. But the idea here is that what we can do is we can take a look at impedance. So let's actually, let's spell out what we're doing here. So now we're going to look at resonance. And we'll see how it connects to everything else that we've talked about today. Reactances, the power, the circuit and everything. So um, we can take a look at impedance. And we see that in the impedance equation, the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are at odds with one another. They're subtracting, right? So there's a possibility that we can cancel these quantities and get a zero here. So we can set this, whoops, set, we can set equal to zero, right? How would we do that? Well, if XL is going to equal X sub C, we can't really make inductance equal capacitance, can we? But we do have this other quantity to play with, and that is omega. So we have omega times L, and we have 1 over omega times C, right? So we can solve this expression for omega, and we have root LC square root of L times C. So this is what we would call the resonance frequency of the circuit, of the RLC circuit. So resonance uh, frequency. Um, this is the angular frequency actually, so we can maybe uh, angular here, we can fit in an angular, right? Might as well just write out the whole word frequency. Okay, um, if we want the frequency, we can just do 1 over 2 pi, right? 1 over 2 pi, 1 over square root of L times C. Now, um, that's nice that we can play around with the frequency and, um, and minimize the impedance, right? That's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's something that we didn't have before in DC circuits, right? So the reactances of these inductors and capacitors, 
um, change with respect to the frequency of the source voltage or the, or the source current. Um, and so uh, ultimately you can play around with that frequency and minimize the impedance by selecting this frequency as the frequency for your source. So what is the meaning of that frequency? Well, let's say, for example, you have a rotating loop of wire, right? The frequency of that rotation, the number of times that that loop um, turns 360 degrees, the number of times it does that per second, that's the frequency, right? So you can figure out what that number is and you can set up your, your generator to rotate at that speed um, or at that frequency, I mean. So when you do this, it makes Z uh, a minimum value. So the minimum value that Z can take is the square root of R squared plus zero squared, which is R, right? We don't have to worry about absolute value bars here because resistance is a real number, right? Um, you can't have negative resistance and complex resistance doesn't, is, is not, a, imaginary resistance is not a real thing, right? Um, so the impedance equal to R, that's minimum impedance. That means we're gonna maximize current. That means current will be a max when the impedance is a min. So um, the voltage of the source uh, divided by Z, let's actually, let's ditch the S subscript here divided by the min impedance, right? Voltage divided by a minimum imp impedance would give you a maximum current, right? So um, there you go. The book actually goes into a good amount of detail um, and shows some plots that are quite interesting that you should take a look at um, where they talk about how the reactance is changing um, with respect to the phase angle and um, the log of the angular frequency. So definitely take a look at those things. And you can really see, it really uh, kind of illustrates how the impedance is reaching this minimum value. And, um, and you have um, Z equal to R at that value. So it's a good read there in the book. Um, this has many applications to um, wireless communications. If you set up a circuit in some region away from you and you set up a, a circuit here at the table and you set the, the resonance frequency of the two circuits to be the same. And then when you turn on the first circuit here at the tabletop, you'll get a response in the circuit, um, you know, kind of far away from you. I mean, you, you have to think about the kind of mechanism that's at play there. One such mechanism, obviously, is Faraday's law, right? So you can have the changing magnetic field affect the, um, the circuit um, that's far away from you, right? And since you have an alternating current, of course, the current is always changing, right? So there's always a changing magnetic field. And that's going to induce currents in the second loop, right? The second circuit. Um, so there are other mechanisms um, uh, for doing that as well. Um, but yeah, so resonance is a very important topic. Um, to close things off here, um, since we're just about out of time, we don't really have time to go into many more examples. There are some examples in the book. Take a look at them. I do want to close things off with briefly describing how to handle um, more complicated um, AC circuits because they will pop up on the homework here and there, but I tried not to make it you know, too crazy. Um, so more complicated um, AC circuits. So suppose we have a circuit here where we have maybe some stuff happening that we're not sure about, but then we have some, so for example, here, we have um, some stuff that we're not sure about what's going on here, but we are analyzing this part of a circuit here, 
and it happens to be like a parallel connection, right? So it's not something that we've directly addressed yet in the lecture, but certainly it's something we should be able to handle. So we'll call this one R2 and this one R1 and this one C. Um, so if we can kind of sweep the rest of the circuit under the rug and just look at this portion of the circuit, well, one thing that we know for sure is that VAB is the voltage, you know, between the points A and B here in the circuit. It must be shared by these two branches of the circuit, right? That's by definition. These two branches are connected in parallel because they share two junctions, right? They share the same two junctions. So in, there's not really a way to combine these two branches into an equivalent branch, right? Because we have a capacitor in one branch, we have an inductor in the other branch. The resistors are not connected in parallel or series, right? They're part of other combinations. But what we can do is we can analyze each branch of the circuit with the methods we already know, namely with the impedance. So in order to, so suppose we know, so suppose we know VAB, right? If we know VAB, then we can figure out the current in this branch here, and I'll call it, um, I'll, I'll, let's say this is I1, and let's say this is I2, and let's say this is like the big current that kind of comes in. These are not DC currents, these are AC currents, but I'm drawing them in a way to kind of give you a sense of what I mean by I1. Um, I1 is going to be given by the voltage VAB divided by the impedance, right? Because if I have an alternating uh, voltage from uh, across the points A and B, right, then there's an impedance associated with that resistor and that capacitor. There's no inductor in that branch, in the first branch. And so the impedance here would be square root of R squared plus XC squared, right? No inductor. So there's the, the minus sign gets squared, right? So it adds. Um, in, in, uh, for I2, same, same type of thing here. So Again, alternating voltage, so we apply our phasor uh, analysis and we can write, you know, okay, the current I2 is VAB over Z. And in this case, Z is the square root of R squared plus XL squared, right? So um, even if we have slightly more complicated circuits, we can still apply the same analysis. I can still calculate XC for the capacitor. I can still calculate XL for the inductor. I can still calculate Z because those guys are connected in series, right? I have, um, I have a resistor and a capacitor in series, so I can calculate an impedance for that um, and so forth. So like if I knew the current instead of the voltage, how would I calculate the voltage? I would just do the same thing. I would do I times Z to get V, right? So even slightly more complex circuits uh, can be broken down um, simply by analyzing the series circuit, right? So master the series circuit and you've mastered, or you've almost mastered everything else, okay? Um, so any questions about that? We're a little bit over, that's where we're gonna call things. So let me know if there are any questions. Um, like I said, so some of these more complicated circuits, uh, there's not too many of them. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a decent number of them on the second assignment, but not really on the first assignment. Thank you for your attention. So I'll go ahead and end the recording there. Um, so bye YouTube. <laughs>